Veronica. Um, well, it's my privilege tonight to uh, introduce Jay. He's, um, I don't think you realize how influential you've been to me over the years. I've listened to a lot of history and printed off a lot of stuff for guys that I sponsor. And um, so uh, you remain an inspiration to me. I, I think Jay's kind of like AA's wise bohemian uncle, you know? Um, and uh, so uh, we are all super, I know everybody was uh, really um, saddened by the loss of Adele, but she was such a beautiful human being and, um, you know, um, all of our thoughts and prayers went out, uh, to you there. And, uh, I'm just so grateful to have you tonight and, uh, we'll let you take it away. Well, thank you, Sam. I, you know, and, uh, thanks everybody for all your kind thoughts and, and wishes, uh, for the tall girl. Uh, I'd like to say that I was with her exactly the amount of time that I was ordained to be with her. I didn't lose her. And uh, our love affair has not ended in the least. So uh, <clears throat> as uh, Wilson liked to say, she's just uh, just beyond my, uh, my sight and hearing, that's all. And uh, although occasionally when she gets really upset, she does let me know about it. But uh, that's the subject for another talk. <laughs> so uh thanks a bunch for uh for being here on thanksgiving thanksgiving's always been a really important day uh in my uh sober life uh it used to be the well it doesn't used to be tonight uh they'll be gathering at the manhattan beach community church to uh sure thing well thank you siri um and they'll be having a, a meeting, and and we always used to go to it. We'd have a, uh, we'd have a Thanksgiving party at my house. The attendees included my, uh, my wife and her mother, my daughter, my ex-wife, her mother, my grandmother, and my wife's sponsors. And one would wonder how does one have the emotional sobriety to be able to survive a confab like that and it was very simple i realized they all had a common enemy me so uh so anyway um you know the uh when i'm 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 deeply uh joyous at the fact that we're at a time where we might have the opportunity to liberate Bill Wilson and our message from it being treated like a religion. And this particular uh, piece that Bill wrote for the grapevine is, it's just wonderful. And it's being treated uh, like it's uh, an epistle. And, uh, you know, Wilson wrote hundreds and hundreds of letters. And, and, uh, and just to let you know where he was in January of 1958. And I believe uh, my, my book will be, uh, uh, I'm submitting the manuscript to the, to the publisher uh, uh, in the middle of January. And it's called Bill Wilson and the Frontiers of Consciousness. And, uh, in January of 1958, he and some friends were involved in work with the parapsychology department at Duke University, doing their best to prove that uh, precognition, or ESP as it's, it, it became known, was a, uh, uh, was a viable communication device with the other side. Uh, he was involved with a group of people uh, that were uh, putting together, uh, there, there would be a group of intellectuals in New York in July, August, and September of 1958 that would be going through what was known as psychochemotherapy. Uh, it was an LSD uh, uh, 
program that Wilson and Tom Powers developed with uh, Professor Gerald Hurd and Eugene Exman to um, find out whether or not this new medication had the ability to lead people into the next stage of human consciousness development. Um, all medically supervised, lots and lots of documentation, all that, all that great stuff. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to, to listen to these people's experiences. And <laughs> there's nothing really quite as boring as listening to somebody else's LSD experience, but there, there's, there are a few, a few bond mods that are, that are, that are available there. Um, he was also uh, uh, involved in a, in, in a marriage that was dutiful and uh, he had become uh, uh, involved, it had, it had been two years by this time that uh, he had been involved with a, a woman that uh, shared his vision and his uh, passions for the evolution of, of uh, uh, human consciousness. Uh, he was also involved with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Humphrey Osmond and Abram Hoffer in investigating the use of niacin as a way of alleviating uh, emotional trauma and helping uh, support adrenals. And he was also involved in bringing to market a, uh, a product called leucoandrenochrome that was a natural non-narcotic substance that supported adrenals. Now, it's, I think it's just fascinating that nowadays we've got so much information about PTSD and the amount of adrenal crisis that any real alcoholic is in uh, uh, and has suffered that it's, it's really quite wonderful that these were the types of projects that Wilson was involved with. And uh, he had a deep, vibrant uh, intellectual and social life with some of the great thinkers of the 1950s and the 1960s. So when we take a look at this, you know, you could read this and go, oh my God, poor Bill, you know, oh, look at him. He's just, uh, he was having so much fun. He was, he was, uh, uh, and, and so I just want to, I, I, I want to contextualize this and let you know that, um, that when we, when we're, we're talking about this emotional sobriety, I, I really, I really love the fact that, that, you know, I, I think the baseline in, in emotional sobriety is that it's nobody else's fault. That I am responsible for my consciousness and I am responsible for addressing whatever the vagaries are and whatever the fallout is of my sobriety, be it uh, uh, at five years or 10 years or 15 years or 40 years. And I, I think it's really uh, interesting in, in, the, in the letter it mentions, well, you know, at 17 years old, you know, you could, you could go along with something like this. It would be reasonable at 17 years sober. You could go along with this and it'd be kind of reasonable. So, you know, there's this, this evolutionary thing and, and, and this idea that somehow, some way, we are going to control and enjoy our thinking or our emotional nature by coming up with some kind of cheat code, which is either going to allow us to spiritually leap leapfrog doing the basic work day to day that we need to do or to um, somehow investigate myself to the point where I'll get to an understanding where I'll be able to live with myself enough that I can enjoy myself. I've been fortunate enough to be now sober for 50% of the experience of Alcoholics Anonymous. And although both of those things are really fun, and really interesting, there is still this um, wheel that we're on. 
that allows us to take a look at our past in a different light, come to terms with our present and outpicture our future. And uh, just for fun, I, I, um, here's a little uh, letter that Bill wrote to uh, uh, a friend in uh, 56. He says, uh, I suppose that about half of the AA old timers have neurotic hangovers of one sort or another. Certainly, I don't number myself among them. Uh, you interest uh, me very much when you talk of Karen Hornet. Uh, I've been of, a, she was a fantastic, the, the name is spelled H-O-R-N-E-Y. She was a fantastic uh, uh, pioneer, one of the great feminine forces in psychiatry in, the, uh, in New York in the uh, 40s and 50s, a real um, amazing uh, consciousness. Um, uh, to, do, to, to Karen Hornet. Um, I have the highest affirmation for that gal's insights. They have been most helpful to me also. For the benefit of screwballs like ourselves, it may be that someday we shall devise some common denominators of psychiatry. Of course, throwing away their much abused terminology, common denominators which neurotics could use on one another. The idea would be to extend the moral inventory of Alcoholics Anonymous to a deeper level, asking an inventory of psychic damages, reliving in conversation certain episodes, etc. I suppose someday a Neurotics Anonymous will be formed which will actually do all this. Meanwhile, this kind of stuff I see in your letter is uh, good medicine for any AAs anywhere. Um, so <clears throat> one of the other things that Wilson was very involved with from the beginning, in 1942, he started to uh, uh, enjoy the benefits of union uh, analysis with Francis Weems up in, uh, 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 Nantucket, uh, Massachusetts, and Weems also had a, uh, a uh, another patient, the Countess Margarita von Lutenkau, who uh, had come over, she had dual citizenship and had fled the Second World War and was working at uh, John Hopkins Hospital. And she became familiar with the work of Alcoholics Anonymous because she met Bill and they started talking and, and, and all this great stuff. And her, her vision was to create a, a Neurotics Anonymous. And there are about five or six start, starts and uh, stops that Bill participated in one way or another. Uh, one of the groups he said was he felt a little uh, separated because he was the only one who hadn't had electroshock therapy. <laughs> Uh, we can always find ways to separate ourselves. Anyway, um, von Lutenkau, after the war, went back to uh, uh, Switzerland with the book Alcoholics Anonymous that Bill had given her to give to her mentor, Carl Jung. And she visited with Jung. She brought him the book and a couple pamphlets. Jung took a look at them and they got together the next day and he gave her specific instructions on how group work uh, of this kind could be helpful to neurotics. Up until that point, Jung had always said that he was not in, in favor of group work at all because uh, the individual would not take responsibility for their own spiritual development. They would uh, cast it off onto the group. He used uh, religious uh, revival meetings and, and Oxford group t t as, as things where people would have this vital conversion, but then if they didn't do the personal work, it wouldn't stick. Uh, so um, this thing of creating a neurotic synonymous about the fact that, look, we all got this stuff. 
Why is it that we are pretending or not pretending? I like to look at Alcoholics Anonymous in generations and the generations being with editions of the book. First generation, you're not drinking. How can there possibly be a problem? If God can solve the drink problem, there is nothing in your life that can't be solved. You're applying these principles. Second book comes out, second edition comes out in 1955. There's problems. <laughs> We haven't quite been able to get through, but we cannot drink and 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 let's let's you know let's stick to the main thing, keep the main thing, the main thing. By the time the next edition of the book comes out in 1976, the experience of the fellowship is such that we know that you can try anything sober. You don't have to just be white knuckling the, the meetings and making sure that you're just going to the meeting, everything has to do about not drinking. You can actually have careers, love affairs, create, do all kinds of things that were absolutely impossible and see if they work or they don't. But if we use these principles, they, they, they have the opportunity to, uh, 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 you know, you, you don't drink no matter what, but you, we, we stay within that, uh, within this pocket of um, spiritual evolution and trying different stuff. And part of trying different stuff is, uh, is this idea of um, getting outside help. There's a, there's a, uh, there's an anti-intellectualism um, that exists that, that, that looks down upon people getting professional help. And where that comes from comes nowhere from Wilson. It's, it's not in any of AA's material at all. And many of the letters, I, I'm, I'm one of the most fortunate male forms you've ever met because I, I, I've, I've been able to read over 2000 of his letters. I'm, I'm now um, gifted with an access to Wilson that nobody's ever had. Um, and so uh, I feel that I also have a, have a relationship with the, uh, the coffee shop Wilson, not the not the one that we've deified. And so this thing of taking this letter, which was wonderful, wonderful stuff, and making it as though it is something that has come down to us, you know, and uh, and In classical religion, there are two types of sin. There's sins of commission and sins of omission. We need to take a look at how are we addressing this incredible gift that we have? Are we looking at ways that we can make this available to others? Or are we more uh, interested in making sure that people that have got 15, 20, 25 years of sobriety um, are comfortable? You want a frontier? That's, you want emotional sobriety? It's what are we doing for the person that's, 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 that's coming to us? Um, One of the one of the great things uh, there's a there's a letter from uh, Wilson to uh, uh, Bill was not when we talk about uh, all these different ventures that he was involved with he was never hiding them by the way uh, 
he lived his life authentically. How we treated him was entirely different. But anyway, here's this uh, uh, letter that he wrote uh, in 57 to uh, a Jesuit uh, friend of his. He said, uh, someday when my personal, uh, deeper personal failings are more widely understood, these ideas will almost certainly collapse. Perhaps some will be disillusioned and hurt, but the credit then will fall where it belongs upon God himself for doing so much with so many misshapen creatures. Summing it all up, I can say that my experience, is talking about a spiritual experience, uh, caused me instantaneously to believe and know God as my father, that his grace is available to me and that life goes on beyond the grave and that in his house, there are many mansions. These are things I think I know. All the rest of course is a nature of uh, pure speculation. Are we using this gift that we have to foment this innate creativity that each of us possesses? To be able to pass these gifts along and encourage others in every aspect of human endeavor. I'm, 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 my experiences, my personal experience is that I, uh, I'm kind of like uh, Tallulah Bankhead. I'm as pure as freshly driven slush. Um, but, uh, but what I really mean by that is that all of my all of my challenges as a human seem to be evolutionary, and it isn't a matter of uh, of uh, banging on myself uh, one more time, doing steel on steel or some other intense spiritual practice where I'm watching my every move that gives me the ability to walk and move and have my being in the in the world. When in this letter, one of the things that Wilson talks about that's a lot of fun is uh, uh, this idea that uh, this, he's, he's applying the St. Francis prayer in a different way. Now, um, you know, one of the things that we're charged to do now is, or we're not charged to do, but I feel that I am is I need to make sure that I'm making Alcoholics Anonymous as safe for anybody to come into as the AA that I came into. And, uh, and so to make sure that I'm changing the way that I speak, make, not because I have to, because I want AA to be the safest place it can possibly be for the new person. It's funny you hear people talk about, well, they're trying to change my big book. Well, they're never gonna change the first 164 pages anyway. Number one, it's a historical document that'll always be there, but it's not your big book. How do you like that? It's the book that the new person is going to get. And can they apprehend what's in it? Can they apprehend what's in, the, in this chip of the book or do they have to go to a workshop? Do they have to have a translator in order to get the information or do they have to have a, a level of education that some of us have been graced to have received? Just an opinion, but it's a good one. And, and, uh, and it should be yours. Um, the, uh, uh, another, uh, marvelous, uh, thing is this, this prayer that he talks about, you know, he says, I've been, I've been working with it for, you know, since last autumn. So, um, I wanted to, uh, 
to suggest <clears throat> how uh, those of you who were fortunate, I filmed my wife, you know, we, uh, we wrote a, a, a book about a spiritual field guide to, uh, to relationships. And, uh, but, the, but the engine that drove it has always been the shared meditative practice. So I want to go back to this idea that there's some kind of cheat code that you can somehow be sane and sober and have a rich, full life and only work 11 and a half steps. I ain't ever witnessed it personally. And, uh, but if you haven't played with this particular prayer, it is the best thing I have ever run across for anybody that has any conflict in anywhere in their life. So I'd like to suggest just for fun, we talk uh, 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 about uh, in our, our traditions about each AA group uh, ought to be a spiritual entity having only one primary purchase. So I'd like to kind of ramp the spiritual entity up on this a little bit. And um, um, this is my experience that sitting down with anyone that I cohabitate with, be it a lover or a friend or just a roommate, and walking through this prayer responsorily changes everything. Changes everything. And you know, we're coming up on a on a new year. Why not come up with a new uh, a new practice? So what what I'd like to suggest what Adele and I would do is that every morning we would sit and uh, touch each other and we would read this prayer for peace responsorily. Now, it's not called the St. Francis prayer in the 12 and 12 because Francis didn't write it anyway, but that's another story and who cares? But it's an incredibly powerful document. So what I did was I uh, uh, not only would we do it at home but we we you know so we we read it back and forth to each other so what i did was i i did this from a uh, uh hopefully it, it'll translate and we can get it up on the screen but i'd like to invite us to close this thing by being quiet for three minutes and then when it's done those who identify with the male form um read the blue part, those who identify with any other form, the purple part. And then we'll all read the last line together. So, uh, and I think the practice in this meeting is, is that we say the thing silently to ourselves or whatever. So I'll kind of ping pong it back and forth just as a, as a demonstration. But if you really want to have some fun, Ask the person that you share your life with. They may not even be in the same house. You know, the, you know, it works on Zoom really, really well. It works on FaceTime really, really well. And do this every morning and see if something doesn't happen because something happens beyond our thought, beyond our personal experience when we sit in meditation together. And then we get these marching instructions for the day. Be and, and if you're having trouble at work, I always tell people, <laughs> put that thing on your phone so you can see it and read it before you walk into work. So why don't we try for the next few weeks just for fun to see if that enthusiasm that Wilson talks about in the letter can be infused into our homes and our workplaces. So I'll, uh, I'll mind the time so uh, you don't have to. And we'll do uh, three minutes of silence and then we'll responsorily say this prayer in the fashion that, uh, that I, I wrote. Hey Jay, before you start, I just want to let you know that yeah. I've got I've put it in the chat, but it doesn't translate wow. the colors. So I don't know. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll just I'll 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 just read it and I'll I'll do this and this. Okay. okay. Sorry yeah. about that, man. Oh, it's no big deal. You know, sins of commission. I'm not uh, technically adept to have the whiteboard ready and like, but maybe Dr. Berger could do this for us because um, he's got some chops. So, uh, um, and by the way, uh, the work that he does, and I've known him. A long time and uh and the impact that it's made is a wonderful wonderful gift to the fellowship specifically about this this letter and the way that it approaches problems so back to oh we don't want to do the 22 that's my that's my usual go-to okay so three minutes i'll mind the time Thank you. A prayer for peace. Make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love. That where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. That where there is discord, I may bring harmony. That there, where there is error, I may bring truth. That where there is doubt, I may bring faith. That where there is despair, I may bring hope. That where there are shadows, I may bring light. That where there is sadness, I may bring joy. May I seek rather to comfort than to com be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. And it is by dying to self that one awakens. And then if you're lucky enough to be cohabitating with somebody, you've looked them dead in the eye and read that and you get to give them a kiss and say, let's go do it. So um, let's go out and inflict this great gift that we've been given by our beingness to all. Thanks. Oh, wow. Thanks, Jay. Really appreciate that, man.
I actually ate some acid before I got on here um, and had a, several questions. I was going to, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was going to see if you'd uh, allow me to ask a few questions sure. over the last couple of years. I've had a few things I wanted to find out. So I think I've heard somewhere in one of your lectures or workshops, uh, and this is just whatever your findings were, but often you hear people argue about uh, the first 100. Was it real or, you know, was it real or was it exaggerated? And I thought there was a log. You talked about there being a log. Okay. There actually was 100. Okay, look. Um, there's a wonderful resource called the Symposium on AA History. It's ahistorysymposium.org, okay? And if you look at it, they we've got all of the lectures that were given the first four years available, okay? One of them is a masterful work done by John Barton specifically about the first hundred. And it is incredible. It's got a great PowerPoint to it, all that stuff. He came up with that, that it's accurate. And, uh, but please don't take my word for it. Every one of you, you can go on Stepping Stones website now and you can register and go on the digital archive and you can start, they've, they've put over like 500 documents already. All kinds of different stuff of Bill Wallace's life. And one of the things when it first came out, I called Dr. Berger up and I said, Alan, they've got the letter that was typed out that they sent to the grapevine. It's on there. I mean, you can't, I, I'm a geek, as you know. See. Next. Uh, what is the fourth dimension? So one of the things that Wilson talked about was that I, I think the only way to really make sense of Bill's life and certainly mine, but uh, is that up until Towns Hospital, he was a three-dimensional guy. If you can't kill it and cut it up and dissect it, it ain't real. And, uh, uh, and he was solid with that. He was part of a generation. I mean, can you imagine this? This was the first generation of people that had been educated, uh, at least in some areas, unfettered from religious uh, uh, religious dogma so they believe that you know science was the deal the mystical life which bill said that every aa is on the mystical path whether they realize it or not in a letter to bell barger this thing of the fourth dimension it's having believing that there is a unifying field that one can have a relationship with that can grow and deepen. Awesome. What have been, what have been some of the most uh, exciting discoveries that you've had since you've uh, been going through AA history and researching a lot of stuff? Is there anything that you like just completely blew you away that you had? Well, I think, I think that, uh, see, when I started going down the history wormhole, there were still tens of thousands of people that knew Bob Smith, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people that knew Bill W. So I started out with the Oxford group. And I, I think one of the things that was most fun was um, the prayer that kind of I, I use as the originating prayer of, of where our movement comes from. It was a guy by the name of Blair Buck and, uh, and he and Frank Bookman had had a bet and he'd lost the bet. And so now he's got to pray for this guy that he'd picked this uh, bootlegger, Bill Pickle. And uh, he said, uh, oh God, if there be a God, please help Bill Pickle and all the little pickles. Later on, Bill Pickle ends up getting sober and blah, blah, blah. But this, oh, God, if there be a God. This thing about that, 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 that it's our personal investigation 
and all the stories that go along with that and all the different aspects are, are just marvelous. Um, here's a change of mind I had recently. Um, I always got upset at GSO and Stepping Stones about the um, copyright information. And then I'm reading this letter that Aldous Huxley sent to Bill when Bill was turning over the fellowship. Um, and Krishnamurti had done the same thing. He dissolved the sacred order of the eagle before the thing actually launched. And it's always seemed to me that there's only, the pe only people that I know of are Bill Wilson, George Washington and J. Krishnamurti who took a successful organization and walked away from the, the leadership of it. This is, this is stunning beyond. And, uh, one of my favorite quotes is that AA should be spiritualized and, and uh, enough to uh, rely on its own group conscience and not the opinions of AA elders. What do you think? I mean, you traveled all over and met uh, or been in touch with so many different groups. What have you found to be some of the biggest misconceptions about Bill? That he wanted to create a hierarchy. He was allergic to hierarchy. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a trope that runs around AA that Bill sacrificed himself in his spiritual evolution and didn't become a Roman Catholic because he loved AA so much. Poppycock. He had a buddy who he loved dearly by the name of uh, Ed Dowling, a Jesuit, who put him together with Father uh, J. Fulton Sheen, who was the most glib, fastest moving, best articulator of Roman Catholicism in the United States at the time. And uh, they got together for a number of weeks. Lois called them debating societies. <laughs> Bill could never get over the infallibility of the Pope just for starts. One of, one of the fun things is, is like, like just meditate on this sometime just for a drill. What if Bill would have said, Jesus help me? Instead of, oh God, if, or no, what is it? My favorite of the, 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 the ways it's described is he says, if there be a God, will he show himself to me? Completely different thing. And he said in his revelation that he had no information about uh, the, uh, uh, the divinity of Christ, much less Mary or uh, the Trinity or anything else. Um, another fun thing is, is that uh, uh, there's a great letter where he says, uh, I, uh, he said, Dr. Bob was a, 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 a great reader. He had a, he had a great library of uh, 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 esoteric uh, information. He said, I, on myself, I'm, have never been a reader. And one of the things I've, I always wanted to do earlier in my life was, you know, uh, I, would, I would impose certain sources to Bill's writing. So anybody here, if you ever run across anybody that was like I used to be like, and says, this is what Wilson meant, run away. Run away, he meant exactly what he said. And he wasn't sitting there with a half dozen books cobbling stuff out and trying to figure it out. That's not the, he said, my, my information has almost all come from uh, conversation and, uh, and uh, an observation. And uh, his, uh, his friend and colleague, Tom Powers used to say that uh, Wilson was like Charlemagne. Charlemagne was absolutely brilliant, but he was illiterate, but he had five guys around him that would feed him all the good stuff that was coming down the pike. And Charlemagne was able to apprehend that and synthesize different things and get inspiration to do stuff. And, and Powers 
said Wilson very much the same. I love the fact that Bill was a medium by any standard of what a medium is. And uh, uh, he, gave a, he gave a talk to the Parapsychology Foundation, but in order to give the talk, he had to prove he was a medium. And so he had to send a letter in with a couple of instances and the like. And all of this stuff, by the way, not all of it, but much of it is in um, controversy approved literature. You know, it's a lot of it's mentioned in, um, in past and on. And uh, so my, my, my joy about Wilson is what he did with his life after he turned the fellowship over in 55. This kind of leads me into another question somebody asked me to ask you um, if you could speak on the Lord's Prayer. If I could speak on the Lord's Prayer. Well, <clears throat> um, of course I can speak on the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> There's a couple of fun things. Um, Wilson got a got a letter from a guy down in Australia who was really upset because people seem to be resisting the Christian roots of Alcoholics Anonymous, specifically the Lord's Prayer, and uh, oft quoted and it's in it's in uh, language of the heart. I think it says something about um, well, it says more to do about them than you know their unwillingness to go along with it, you know which you can talk about when in 1955, maybe 3% of the nation is unchurched. Now we're looking at 47%. What do you want to do? Do you want to impose? I mean, uh, you, I, you asked me to talk about the Lord's Prayer. I'll talk about the Lord's Prayer for you. <laughs> Um, you only hear the Lord's Prayer in two places, Christian church and an AA meeting. Why do you think the courts have called us a religion? We walk like a duck, we talk like a duck, we act like a duck. Hopefully in our fit, well, no, we're spiritual. No. You have a sacred book, you have a sacred site, you say, you say the prayer, you pass the basket, what... You, you call yourself not a duck, but come on. Um, I spent most of my life with a Jewish woman. Or not most of my life. I was married for a quarter century. Yesterday was her 25th day of wedding anniversary. And uh, she said she was at a meeting in Los Angeles and a woman wasn't saying the prayer out loud next to her. And she said, I see you're saying something. What are you saying? Because it was obvious another nice Jewish girl. She said, I say the Shema. Do you know why? Because that's what they said when they were being carted off to the death camps. When I'm asked to close a meeting now, I only do the responsibility pledge. Why? Because I want everybody to be able to say it with conviction. Why did I take the uh, the the uh, supernatural stuff out of the so that anybody could use it? If you go on my meditation website, which is the numeral three, and then the words minutesofsilence.org, at the seven o'clock hour, you'll see the initiatives of change uh, logo, and on that is how to listen. The Oxford Group practice. All I did was remove the uh, the Christian alliteration from it it's a marvelous practice so um the the reason the lord's prayer is there is because everything we took was from the oxford group everything our conventions the, i mean it's just it's incredible i think that's yeah, I, yeah i asked the question in the way that i did just because i wanted to just let you open up and go wherever <laughs> you wanted to with it so I mean, I could have said, what does it mean to you or how does that? But I just wanted to see where you would go with it when, when you heard it. You know, I mean, at one point I went, well, you know, where will those principles be? Be, uh, I mean, it's, it's such a marvelous 
gateway. Um, you know, I mean, I have a I have a profound relationship with uh, with that prayer, and anybody that wants a profound relationship, I know that most of us have had uh, have enjoyed uh, Emmett Fox's work, but there was a guy by the name of Glenn with two ends, Clark, and he wrote a book called My Utmost to his highest. And uh, it's got a great set of exercises with the, the Lord's Prayer and it'll just fire, it just fired my ass up when I, when I used it. So I, anybody that wants a, a, a wonderful practice for that, uh, that prayer. But uh, when, uh, when <laughs> Adele introduced me to her, to her family, uh, one of the aunts, she, hey, are you Jewish? And I looked at her and I said, well, I'm, I'm from a heretical Jewish sect. Does it count? <laughs> so you seem to have um, done a lot of research and had been really passionate about the Oxford movement and the history of Frank Buckman and uh, all of that. Do you, uh, do you still do anything with two-way prayer? That was what I that? was. That's that. That's what I was referring to. The how to listen. Mm -hmm. The two way prayer has been hijacked by some of my Christian friends that are in the fellowship. And they they act as though it's something. You know, but yeah, it's how to listen. Yeah. Do you yeah, still I, do that, or can you explain the practice? Well, I, I tell you what. You know, another another wonderful. Uh, 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 way of, of approaching that is uh, the book, The Artist's Way, The Morning Pages. It's the same practice. It's the mm. same practice. I mean, it's, Julia didn't steal it, but it's, it's this idea of letting, it's, it's automatic writing. And that'll make all the two-way prayers prayer people just spin like this but it's it's automatic writing for christ's sakes i mean the, you read that you read the uh the thing on uh uh oh gosh uh, the daily reader the 24 hour a day book was taken from god calling um by two listeners you know, you read the read the introduction to that. You know, that'll that'll show you where that whole thing came from. And it was mm -hmm. just two gals whose sponsors said you have to write together. And Jesus showed up for a year <laughs> and just wrote through them. You know, and and they called this guy. It was AJ Russell. It was the the uh, the uh, uh, the religion editor of the London Times and and uh, and said, "Could you come over and see this?" And he started reading. It and he went, "This is not of you girls." He said, "We know, you know." And so he he figured out a way to edit it, make it into a daily thing, and all that stuff. But uh, but you know, uh, yeah, Jesus will show up. Well, you know, it's uh, interesting. Another two questions and then we'll just open it up. But one of the things I wanted to ask is there's a lot of stuff in our movement now about psychedelics and a lot of uh, attraction to that. You can you can listen to a lot of the research that's been done. Um, and there's a lot of people who say, you know what, you know, in my own private way, I'm going to maybe go do an ayahuasca journey or I'm maybe going to go do this to kind of open my doors of perception or grow my spiritual life. But there's a great caution to that. Um, and I wanted to, I was joking with you about it kind of earlier, but, um, what do well, you say to yeah, people? What, I, what I said was you're in AA, you don't need LSD. I mean, this is as far out as it gets. Um, but, um, anybody that has severe problems and that is medically directed, and supervised, I have, uh, I would never question their sobriety whatsoever. Uh, Wilson's work 
was all around set and setting. And he developed a methodology that was f still being used today. Uh, he was one of the pioneers in that. Um, you'll find people that say that Wilson's white light experience came from Belladonna, or they even say an LSD now, which is just, I mean, it's just nonsense. If you ever hear anybody talking that way, first and foremost, say, hey, dude, or do that. This is America. Follow the money. If a promoter of the power of Charlie Towns thought in any way that what Wilson had at his hospital was exogenously produced, he would have taken out full page ads in the New York Times. If William D. Sirkworth had any idea or belief that some type of exogenous substance could trigger what happened in Wilson. They would have, he would have published widely in any journal, medical journal that was available to, to him at that time. Neither of these men did either. Now, interesting we're all looking for the white light experience oh you know I'll, i i call it psychotourism you know <laughs> i'll go to I'll, I'll go to i'll go to brazil to uh, to get it it's a, they're treating it like a use nice words jay a cheat code um every person in this meeting has had the profound sudden spiritual experience. We're not drinking. What more do you need? What more do you want? Something that science, religion, psychiatry could not produce. And yet we're sitting here and you know, we got 1.4 million people walking around unsupervised in North America. And we act like, oh, it's just, you know, give me evidence-based. What more evidence do you want? That's 1.4 million people not dragging on social services. That's 1.4 million people who aren't, their children aren't afraid of them tonight. Now, do some of them need help? Of course. Um, uh, Dr. Hoffer and Osmond had uh, some marvelous uh, uh, success in uh, uh, Canada working with schizophrenics and skid row drunks, people that AA could not touch statistically. And these are people, there are a lot of them around now that can be helped. And they may be able to assimilate into the fellowship afterwards. Thing is, is, is like many of the, the gray-haired people here, I've seen a lot of different cures of alcoholism and the cure de jour happens to be the shamans. The shamans are gonna cure, you know, you can go and you can have, what happens? What happens in the unit of experience? Well, number one, you see that there is no good and evil. Therefore, it's impossible that alcohol can be evil. I can't tell you the amount of people I know that have had that experience and have started drinking again. Not compulsively in the beginning, but I don't want what they got. And so what happens is, is immediately they get drawn away from the fellowships, because obviously we're, we're wrong because we think that alcohol is bad. We think that alcohol is not good for us. You make your own determination. The other thing is that if I go and I have, uh, you know, this, this idea of self-medicating, 
it just drives me crazy. It doesn't matter what it is, you know, whether it's fishing around in someone else's purse or, uh, or, or going to a, 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 a... So I have an experience with psilocybin. I have a unit of experience. If I am not introduced to a moral community to grow and uh, apply the spiritual truths that I may have been witness to. It's just going to be me. Now, I don't know about you, but I know what happens with me. I'll turn to this exogenous substance. I'll eat it. Well, it never does the same thing the second time that it did the first. So I'm either going to have to increase the dosage or I'll try MDMA or I'll go to the, the Amazon or I'll do this or I'll do that. <laughs> but again, this cheat code that somehow I'm going to have to do something outside of myself to change the way I feel about myself. When the only thing that changes the way that I feel about myself is looking the people in the eye whose trust I've violated asking what I can do to make it right, spending time meditating on a daily basis about what it is that I can do to inflict the joy that I've been given uh, on others, and asking that I be sent a drunk. All right, last question completely unrelated. There seems to be some really specific directions in the big book, and some of it um, I, I'm really, uh, I'm, I've found the formula, uh, or the outline for writing inventory in the big book to be, um, extremely helpful. And the way that it was, um, suggested that we do it. And I'm wondering, I don't think Bill had that, you know, you know, some people do four columns, some people do five column, and then you'll have some people do a thousand columns, but Adela then you have do nine. Adela yeah. Do nine. Yeah. 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 But but specifically, like that, I I find the sixty six and sixty seven to be very valuable. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering when Bill worked the steps of the Oxford Group. There's no there's no way he had that formula, right? So where did that formula come from in the Big Book? I mean, where did he where did he get that outline from? Or maybe I'm wrong. I was a pagan. Yeah, the VC kitchen. Mm -hmm. So you take a look at this. I, I just love this. Where is it hiding? It's hiding from me somewhere. Here. Such a cool book, by the way. Yeah, but in it, like one of the things is, is that there's a uh, there's a two column. Um, Thing. And the, the thing that I like about it is that the pagination is exactly the same. Now, if you read Bill Wilson's um, uh, My First 40 Years, he talks about an inventory. So how about this? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, the font's the same. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. Now, did he sit down with the book and break that out? I don't think so. You know, I, I, you know, I, that's, but he may have remembered it. He may have referred to it. I, I, I don't have a clue. Um, I, I, I would refer anybody freely to my friend and colleague, William Shaberg's book, writing the big book and take a look at what's in there. I don't remember because Bill, that's, that's his, that's his deal. So I let him, let him run with that. But his, uh, um, but the stuff on the writing of chapter five, um, you know, is, uh, anyway. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Let's, uh, open it up. Anybody who wants to share, maybe raise your hands. Anybody have any questions or comments? Don? Hi, I'm Dawn. I'm alcoholic. 
John. Thank you, Jay. That was incredible. I've, um, first of all, I've been trying to catch some of your uh, the things you've referred to and posted them in the chat. Um, I also uh, saw earlier that um, Dr. Berger was in here. And if you, if, I'm just saying this to the group as a whole, I put this in the chat last week. If you didn't listen to this, you're, you're missing, you're really missing something. So it's, it's in there again, it's a YouTube um, uh, talk on emotional sobriety. So that's enough of that. Uh, time for nightly review. But um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I listen to people such as yourself and, and it really gives me hope that with you know the time and sobriety that I have, that I am able to go further. That there's the, the you know the window is not going to close for me to continue to grow and prosper spiritually. And I too, um, you know, I'll do anything. Roll it out there, whatever it is. I mean, I'm I got like seventy. If you look at my morning space, there must be like. 40 different versions of life happening there. And, you know, I'll switch from silent uh, uh, meditation, automatic writing, pulling tarot cards, oracle cards, you know, burning sage, flipping over candles for people. I don't care what it is. I'm in. And, <laughs> and me and Bill would have had a good time. I mean, we would have a good time. I go see psychics. I get all kinds of stuff. I'm all in on all of it. Whatever you got, I'm, I'm in. And, um, and I've literally been moved, physically moved by the spirit. So I believe all entirely in the fourth dimension of existence. I too lost a um, spouse that I adored and still adore seven years later or after, you know, he went to just on the other side of my view. So, and I have a um, continuing dialogue with that presence and some other presences and guides and, and all these things. I mean, I'm all in on this stuff. And um, I think that uh, I also go, you know, do trauma and grief workshops. I've done externalization, spitting. I throw, me and my grandson go up to my studio. We take eggs and throw them against the side of my studio because, you know, we just throw this stuff out. I mean, all kinds of dramatic whatever. I will tell you this. When I was drinking, I wasn't the girl that was like, I wasn't a kitchen drunk. I was standing on the bar. I mean, <laughs> I was up on the top of the bar trying to figure out how to, you know, get it. So the fact that I have... um you know, it's a, it's a part of my personality. And I think it's a wonderful part of my personality. I um, have really been pondering over the course of the past week. I was listening to um, Dr. Berger's talk again. And it talks about uh, trauma and how we adapt our lives to accommodate the traumas. And, you know, I always, until I listened to this the second time around, um, cause it's, a, it's, it's really deep. And, um, you know, I had, I had a lot of trauma as a child and I don't, I don't, um, if people got to go do ayahuasca, if they go to the, good for them, because if you went through the stuff that I went through as a child, you're going to need something, you're going to need something. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was listening to this thing about being these adaptation, what we, we in AA refer to as character defects. And he said, it's just a way that my personality was warped by this, you know, the experiences of my early childhood development. And, you know, it really felt so comforting. I'd rather be warped than defected. Defected to me sounds like, you know, like somehow I, I got it wrong. You know, it's like defective. But in fact, you know, I'm just warped from, from jump, warped. And um, to undo that warping and all the, all the psycho-spiritual approach that it takes to begin to get there, just to even begin to get there, to open up the door for a 
releasing from the bondage of self, it takes continual um, walking slowly with purpose towards something that is somehow more, somehow beyond. And um, if I got to a place where, you know, the course was shut down by ideology, I'm screwed. I'm screwed. And um, so I really appreciate the way you brought all the things together. Can't wait to the um, the book comes out. I'm, I mean, you know, put me on the mailing list. I'm in. I just, you know, it just. Thank you. Thank you for your service to the fellowship, and um, I'll pass. I think we should have like a monthly workshop with you, Jay, where we're just like fireside with Uncle Jay. <laughs> Charles, would you like to share? Mm -hmm. Jay, I am totally blown away, man. That was just uh, incredible. I just loved every minute of it. It, just, it. it brought me around so so much as though know, one, I'm not on that intellectual level. And um, it just, uh, I spent so many years, I'm 33 years sober, and I spent the last, oh, shoot, um, probably four years and I think on this meeting here for last couple, three years on this emotional sobriety thing, trying to chase that thing that takes away the doubt. Uh, information, you know, for me, I, I can't retain it. Uh, I, I tell people, you know, I, said, I don't know if it's that first shot of whiskey or that last handful of LSD, I said, but I don't retain and um, and raised with uh, uh, no education. I, I still, um, I know that there's one thing that's possible in my life and that's not to drink today. And most of that is, is through the idea that uh, my only mental defense has to come from working with another alcoholic. And, and like you said, pointing out, you know, that the, mine has to be that simplicity of life. I, I read the prayer is on my, my wall. I, I read it often. I understand it. Uh, but it's like I gave a talk the other day at an anniversary meeting and I had the left side of my brain and my right side of the brain fighting at the same time I was trying to speak. <laughs> and uh, for an alcoholic like me, that just don't work out well. But, you know, just to, to listen to you guys, and I've, I've heard you several times over the years. And uh, I really appreciate it. And, uh, Actually, Tom Powers is in my legacy or legacy of a sponsorship. Uh, uh, but um, I want to thank you for uh, sharing the way you did and uh, giving that hope to an alcoholic like myself, you know, that uh, uh, it isn't chasing that thing that's going to keep me sober because the only thing that's actually going to keep me sober is the res responsibility statement. And if I can stay within that, you know, that statement, I have nothing to fear. So thank you again, brother. God yeah. bless. Hey, Jay, who is a certain American statesman? I don't know. Okay. You got Somebody the wrong guy. Ask you that question. I'm, not the, I'm not the, I'm not, I'm not the, I'm, I'm not the, Book Alcoholics Anonymous, break it down, guy. Well, since now I feel foolish about asking that question, it was from somebody else. They sent it to me. So um, sorry about that, Jay. Sarah. Hi, everyone. Sarah, alcoholic. Um, Jay, thank you so much. That was um there was really so much in there that that caught me and and you know that I got to look at a, a different perspective on one of the things you had mentioned was the intellectualists I think you called them that were against seeking professional help 
And I have um, uh, something to share on that matter, kind of a cautionary tale. I um, was sponsoring a woman that had come to me and she was 10 years sober when she came to me. And um, she had been um, attending AA or involved with a community within AA that said, if you are taking psychiatric medications, you are not sober. And this woman suffered from severe bipolar and depression, which is a chemical imbalance in the brain. And I'm not a doctor, but I know that. And I know that, you know, so when I started working with her, we went back to steps one, two, and I mean, from the very beginning, I mean, she was 10 years sober, but I took her right back to the beginning and she did the most thorough one step, one, two, and three. And then she was still like, you know, she was, we were finally getting to the point where I was telling her, I said, whoever's told you that is wrong. And I pointed to her, I brought her through the big book and I brought her to the pages like 133, where God has abundantly supplied us with fine doctors and physicians and psychiatrists make good use of them. And then there's page 89, 92, 134, 569. There's, I mean, abundance of pages where, where Bill actually talks about use the doctors, make good use of them, seek, seek professional help if you need it. And um, what ended up happening, and this is where this becomes a cautionary tale, you know, I was able to encourage this woman because she was so depressed to go back to, you know, get some, seek, seek some further professional help and maybe get something else. I didn't know, but, you know, to talk to them about it. And they put her on a medication and she, and they put her on a medication to increase her you know, to enhance, you know, like, a, I don't know, one of those ones, Risperidone, I think it was, and it was supposed to in, in help her antidepressants and stuff like that. And, um, and, and she was on it for two weeks and at, at two weeks, and this was just when it was just maybe starting to take hold, but somebody said something to her and I mean, blatantly just called her out and said, you're on, what do you know? You're on those psych meds. And you said, you know, that's not sobriety. You're not sober. And, and um, which I tried to help her with that and everything. That woman committed suicide. Yeah. So the cautionary tale is that the, you know, for us, I mean, I know where to point out in the big book, there's nothing in the big book that says not that we're not sober on those drugs or on those medications, but there's a lot in the big book that says to seek professional help. And so that is my cautionary tale about that. And, and it was something that was very much a learning experience for me in carrying the message and, and to, to practice these principles is that I don't have that I don't have that right or qualification or anything to, to tell somebody that they're not sober because they're taking medication. If I'm taking, if I'm, I'm taking, I could take bladder control medication, shit, I'm still sober, but you know, um, I, I, it just, it just really just, I, it infuriated me that, you know, that woman's life was lost because of that kind of ignorance in the program of, uh, within the, within the fellowship. I mean, this was, these were long timers. These were people with multiple, multiple years of sobriety. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. I want to, I want to be really clear. I said anti-intellectuals. Anti-intellectual. Yeah. I want to okay. be really clear about that. Okay. Number two is, is that um, this ignorance because what they're doing is they're ignoring what it is that science has done. Psychopharmacology, that it has evolved. Their resentment and their opinion goes back to when psych meds were not what we know them as. Mm. There was Milltown and there was barbiturates and that's about that. And, and it was so bad, it was so epidemic in AA that they even wrote a, wrote a pamphlet about what about those goofballs, right? Yeah. That was about trying to say, look, this is, this is, you have to really watch these addicted medications. And so, and a lot of those people died drunk. And so the lineage of that that uh, 
that goes to those experiences of people watching people they love die drunk, just as you did. But it's not, it's, it, it wasn't created in a vacuum of evil, although I'd like to treat it like it was. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, that's just a, a little contextualization of where that comes from. But you're, you're absolutely right. And um, unfortunately, uh, Well, the will to hierarchy is human. And these, those kinds of opinions come from dogmatic and hierarchical groups. And, um, and that dogma and that hierarchy helps people that, that some of us can't help but I don't know how we can change them. Mm. Thank you. Well, we're going to have to have you back, Jay. We are, we've come to an end. And anybody who was wondering about a certain American statesman, it was uh, Alfred E. Smith, four-time New York governor and first Roman Catholic guy to run and lose for president. So uh, anyway, much love to you all. Uh, Jay, do you have any final closing things that you'd like to that have come to you all? No, just that uh, try saying that prayer with the people that you love. Mm. Open your heart. I mean, my my daughter, when she visited me, I used to have her hold the timer when it was just her and I. Um, dream deeply and uh, each and every one of us has a creativity and a dream that we've had since we were before life kind of got in the way of it and that sober we have the power and the privilege to encourage each other to be that unique expression of god this is what the steps provide us with the opportunity to do and uh pray and meditate the way you drank and used just try shit see where you end up but if you ever meet anyone that says Alcoholics Anonymous is a warmer form of spirituality, look them dead in the eye and agree with them and back out of the room because they'll never get it. They'll never get that what we do is what every spiritual master ever said to do. We go to the hospitals, we go to the prisons, we feed the hungry, we clothe the naked. But what we get to do Every day is raise the dead. You want evidence? That's it. Amen. Well, the way we uh, tradition of this group is we close uh, our meeting um, by uh, muting ourselves and going to our inner room and uh, saying the Lord's Prayer to ourselves or a prayer of your choosing. And um, sorry we didn't get to call on everybody. I wish we could, but. Um, next time my, my phone number's there if you want to speak to me my phone number's there for a reason okay and before, and before we and before we close i'm gonna put the word document that you sent me jay with the blue and the purple version of the okay. peace prayer i'm yeah. gonna post it on the on the on our facebook page we have an okay. emotional sobriety works workshop facebook page so you can do that the way he uh expressed to do it um, thank you all for being a part of this. I'm going to chime in here, Sam, because it, some people, if they're not an invited, uh, it's a closed group. So if you want to um, be added to the group, I'm going to put my phone number in the chat. I can invite you to the group. So, yeah. So there you go. Thanks for making this Thanksgiving very, very memorable for me. I won't forget it. Can I say something very quickly? Mm -hmm. 
It's Alma Alcoholic. I want to give you an Oscar. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Now I'm giving this Oscar <laughs> to every person who is in this room is still sober. Okay. Please note that the date is 2022. We had this in 2020, in 2021, in the pandemic, I can, I'm painting, I can paint whatever I want. You get this Oscar for your commitment, for your will, and for just being. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm calling from Happy Toronto. My name is Alma. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Alma. We'll close with the prayer. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. You know what? I made a mistake. Who's ever on the Facebook page? I made a mistake on the uh, Glenn Clark book. Okay. Let me see if I can get it here. Bop, 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 bop. Oh, drat. Drat, 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 drat. Oh, is that it? That's it. Here we go. It wasn't but most of my highest. It, it's uh, Oswald Chamber. No, oh. no, no. I will lift up mine eyes. Oh, okay. That's the that's the Glenn Clark dissection of the Lord's Prayer. Oh, nice. But most of the the highest was uh, yeah, it was Oswald Chambers. But I uh, yeah. I um, anyway, I gelled, which I do Beautiful. on occasion. Thank you so much, Jay. I really okay. appreciate it. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Jay. Jay. Beautiful. Thank Come on, Jay. Thanks, Happy Jay. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Jay, that was beyond awesome. Thank you so much.